going back to just turntables, mixer and, and just records, it, the, the possibilities of things that people still haven't discovered, I think, personally, are endless. Really? I really do. When it comes to juggle patterns, scratching, or just things people haven't thought of yet, I, I do believe there's a lot to mm. still uncover there. But now we've got all the digital stuff, um, I think everyone thinks... There is a whole stigma, I don't even want to go into that, but there's a whole stigma of um, traditional versus technology. And uh, I think a lot of people are just assume that, that because the digital stuff has come out, like um, all the analogue, you know, like... Phase gets phased out. Yeah, or just like um, they believe like there's an advantage to using digital. Or, I mean, yeah, there is, but there isn't as well. Like you can still... Mm. do other stuff on the analog stuff that um hasn't been thought of yet mm. i believe that anyway you need the television app 24 7 mini documentaries podcasts live shows dj live streams top five subscription packages plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports download it from the app store for free today Talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Uh, activity. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, as central as you need to be. Big up yourselves. Always a pleasure to have you here. Good to see you. Good to hear you. It's good to know that your energy is with us and we're doing our thing for street culture over here in central London, as central as you need to be. Um, big shout out to everyone who's got the television app. Hold tight for them. Uh, we love you all. Free download. iPhone, Android for all your street culture sports. All right. From the mini docs to the big docs to the mixes to the podcast. We're here. We're here for you. And all the other bits and bobs. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, the mighty Hodder Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. Um, and yo... You know what time it is? Buzzins, another one, another Don coming through the building. Three times world champion, tell a friend. It's no joke. It's no joke. This guy's toured alongside a whole plethora of people, including my friend Beardy Man, beatboxer extraordinaire. Uh, and if I know anything for certain, when you're a DJ performing with such high energy, high technical ability, you've got to be pretty darn good yourself. JFB in the building. <laughs> How are you, Jen? Pretty good, pretty good. What's going Thanks on? Thanks for having me. What's going on? L- lots of stuff, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Although, um, I think I might have a couple of weeks. Oh, no, no, I've got gigs that have just come in. But no, I will have some time to to um, work in the studio. Just had gigs come fun. in. Let's just, let, me just, let me just dial in on just that one sentence alone. I've just had gigs come in. The, that feeling... Um, and to anybody that has performed in their lives, and uh, there's these there's these moments of sometimes they're just continual, and they help leverage the amount of creative focus you put on on your on your craft. Other times they're sparse. The act, the, the need, the desperation for gigs, and to have one come in would be amazing, and it makes you focus again on your craft to get better which side of the po- uh, the pole are you are you are you focus with less commitments of gigs or focus with more commitments of gigs i would say i am a spoilt grass is always greener kind of person so when when i've got tons of gigs I, I, don't get me wrong i love it i love the gigs so much but i'm always thinking wow like if i had like a couple of weeks off i could do so much you know in the studio and then as soon as i get like um a weekend off i'm like or two weekends off, I start getting paranoid. I think, oh my God, I've got it's no over. gigs. Or like, I have got gigs, but I haven't got to, you know, like, oh no, no one wants to book me, or yeah, yeah, what yeah. am I doing wrong? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I better do all this stuff, you know, and then yeah, suddenly yeah. gigs come in. Or, or you, yeah. But, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> so far, so good. Nothing's going on. It's kind of the top of the year, so you'll be forgiven if there isn't. But there is. There's a lot of shows for JFB at the moment. Um, I mean, this this thing that you've crafted, fine tuned. Ah, oh, first of all, big up DJ Switch, of course, Mr. Switch. Um, you guys are collaborators uh, from Daya. Um, it just feels like you've always been around, working, DJ, building. It always feels like the momentum on you has 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 been on the incline for a long time. Oh, thank you. Wow. Don't you feel that? Um, I I just love it. I just I'll just be doing it since day one. When I, well, since I I got my hi-fi turntables, I suppose mm. when I was sixteen, um, I've just been 
I don't know, just like whether whether you could call it work or not, I've just been enjoying myself, like doing music mm. related things, uh, which is basically mostly DJing. So you had like to what belt belt driven kind of hi-fi. So how old were you when you first discovered that oh shit, I want to be a DJ? Like how, when did that well, start? I used to like so I used to um watch th- random things clips on TV like MTV and I had some cassettes that I stole off my older sisters which mm-hmm. is like jungle techno kind of stuff. And then I knew what hip hop was and all these things and this is before I went out to a club or rave. I was like, you know, 13, 14. Mm. Uh, but because of all these video clips on TV or whatever, it was mostly things like the Prodigy using like a, a Roland 303 or something. Mm-hmm. So I thought DJs, because the music was continuous, I didn't understand the concept of mixing. I thought it was uh, continuous production, but live. I thought they were making wow. the beats live on the machines. And well, I didn't put much thought into it at the time, but that's what I assumed. And then uh, I went to Rave and um, it was amazing because there was... Everyone I knew from my school was there, including the bullies, who were like right dicks. Mm-hmm. Like, am I swear? Sorry, uh, yeah, right, right, right shits. Like, I mean, I was I was no perfect myself, but like these bullies there, like they were at this rave, and I remember seeing them hug me and people. Maybe they used to bully as well, almost accepting everyone in. So this is like um, sensation of I suppose love, which was going on, and I hadn't experienced anything like that as well as bass. I hadn't. I hadn't been in an environment with so much sub bass and it was incredible. And I was like, I, I don't know what, it's, I kind of know what's going on here, but I want I want to be involved in this. And I was like, what, how can I be involved in this? And I was like thinking, okay, there's organisers, security, blah, blah, blah. DJs look like they're having more fun than anyone else. <laughs> and then so I started chatting to my uh, friends at school like about DJing. Last day of school, a friend of mine said, oh, I'm a DJ. I was like, wow, can I can I see what you do? He's like, yeah, come around my place. And um, he had two turntables and a mixer. And I was like, what? Oh, I thought it was something else, you know. But he was like, no, no, it's just like, you know, you have records and you what you're doing is you're merging between, you know, you're, it's called mixing. I was like, that makes complete sense. And I was like, wait, I could do that. He's like, yeah, it's easy. You could do it. He showed me, had a little go. What was, um, it, what was it like when you first were faced with the, the equipment like you were face to face with it this oh, the thing. first thing yeah. automatically is you want to scratch because um well we had a hi-fi one of those hi-fi things at home my parents owned mm. which is you know like hi-fi tent the over stack. top the stack yeah don't touch uh, it or you're in trouble yeah yeah and and, and i and i had previously you know like um what was it i had a, a seven inch of thundercats theme oh, to you know thundercats yeah, in the yeah. 80s like but in french that might because my mum's french and my art he put this is like when i was seven or whatever and i had james bond theme tune i think of vinyl and a reader's digest that i bought for like 20p with my parents at a car boot sale of um loads of film soundtracks still got this sample things, is, uh, yeah they're still yeah, amazing they're <laughs> fundamental man like yeah. i remember like people like dj yoda and you know obviously some early early reference points but yoda used to take those Samples and run to the hills with them. He he has made use of a lot of amazing things in an amazing way that I think no one else would think of multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's great. There's, there's, a, there's loads of tricks out <laughs> of the hat with, with up my guy. Big up Yoda. Yeah. Um so so your mum was French? Yeah, mum's French, dad was Hungarian. Uh, so you do, yeah. do are you bilingual? Uh I can speak French maybe like a four year old and I can probably say two words in Hungarian. Uh, yeah, I know. It's disappointing, mm. I suppose. Well, but, I mean, it, it, it's where you settle, isn't it? You know. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're well, in England. You okay, know I mean? to, it's not so easy yeah, just to pick up things so Okay, so, uh, argument. I mean, not argument. Uh, Defence. Yes. <laughs> in my argument. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my dad couldn't speak French and my mum couldn't speak Hungarian, so they would always speak English. That's a more job. complex kind and, of scenario, um, yeah. And in England, we are spoiled with our language because uh, um, a lot of people in other countries, luckily, speak our lang- embarrassingly speak English very well. Mm. And uh, so we are quite spoiled. Like everywhere I've been mm. around the world, I haven't really had a problem going up to people saying, "Sorry, do you speak English?" And no, the no, majority no. of them say, "Yeah, of course." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Easy, <laughs> exactly. In fact, you have a go at trying to speak their language, they immediately know that you're British, yeah, yeah. and like, <laughs> they start talking in English. Um, th- that being said, though, uh, and this is a bit of a side note for the main conversation here, but uh, French hold down some DJ fucking talent, don't they? Wow. Always have, just cut, it's, it's insane. Cut killer onwards, you know. Just it's absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah, it's bonkers. Um, so uh, you were faced with these decks, and you you jumped straight in with both feet, mm. and, and that was kind of your. Well, um, 
yeah, so I had to go at my friend's place. And I had like, uh, I think I had like 45, to just under 50 pounds saved up. And uh, the next day I literally went out and I found some secondhand hi-fi turntables because I wasn't bothered what kind of decks they were as long as one of them had a little bit of pitch control on it because I understood the concept of like, you use the pitch control to change the time, but mm-hmm. also knew that you could do it manually a little bit. And then uh, a mixer, I found this, oh, I found this amazing mixer, 10 pounds Brand new from Richard Sounds, and it was called the Synergy T1000. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I know it. It was great. It. Yeah. And um, the reason why this mix was amazing, I didn't realise it at the time, but um, the cost fader was terrible. But it had these um, um, phono to line switches, which had like kill switch when you. Which yeah. later on, a year later, I had a friend come around, introduce me to DMC and with the VHSs, yeah. and he went and just went on it and just instantly started transforming on my setup. Yeah, 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 I was yeah, like, yeah. dude the fuck are you doing show me how to do that now please on your own setup yeah yeah amazing it's amazing <laughs> yeah. oh my god because it's all within your you know your abilities but then all of a sudden someone else literally shows you your ass with you know, i had, with something I, had like... I was so excited when i saw it because uh, the first thing I, th- I saw was like he's doing it on my setup which means i can do that mm. and, and i you know like and he, he was this great guy this guy called nick and uh he was like, yeah, it's easy. You just do this. I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, it'll take you five minutes. And like, um, yeah, within 10 minutes, I was going, like, not as tight, but I was doing it. And um, it was amazing. Yeah, was fucking... <laughs> I was so happy. So, so yeah, of course. I mean, who wouldn't be? Some things are breakthrough uh, connect, c- collaborations of, of that size where it's, it's, it's just it's the little list of details, little bits of information that suddenly open huge worlds yeah totally it is nuts it is nuts isn't it it's great well I think we've all had those breakthrough moments where you know I think that there's the, the important thing and I, I get this with DJing and turntablism is exploration is key like if you haven't got the time or whether it's a DJ battle or just for your own curiosity you've really got to find the time isn't it oh it's endless it's still like um, going back to just turntables, mixer, and, and just records. It, the the possibilities of things that people still haven't discovered, I think personally, are endless. Really, I really do. When it comes to juggle patterns, scratching, or just things people haven't thought of yet, I I do believe there's a lot to mm. still uncover there. But now we've got all the digital stuff. Um, I think everyone thinks. There is a whole stigma, I don't even want to go into that, but there's a whole stigma of um, traditional versus technology. And uh, I think a lot of people are just assume that, that because the digital stuff has come out, like um, all the analogue, you know, like... Phase gets phased out. Yeah, or just like um, they believe like there's an advantage to using digital. Or, I mean, yeah, there is, but there isn't as well. Like you can still... Mm. do other stuff on the analog stuff that um, hasn't been thought of yet. Mm. I believe that anyway. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm with you. I'm with you. There's there's these, always these arguments. I remember, you know, <laughs> producers, mix engineers, there'd be the sound walls where, yeah. you know, the, the, the um, use of a mixing desk and all the outboard gear creating the the, the pleasantries of an, an amazing sonic mix. It was being completely outweighed by the likes of Skrillex who were just going straight to the red. You know, Dillinger, straight to the red, all to the red. <laughs> Uh, no, you know, they used to. There's always these arguments between different camps, isn't there? It's, it's crazy. Like, um, yeah, I think like people get stuck in their viewpoints and then they change them mm. as well. They do, and the, I it, mean, yeah, it's human nature. I mean, I'll mm. I'll get up feeling a particular way about something, you know, like, and then two hours later, I've got a different outlook on it completely. So, yeah, it's human. Um, yeah, and I think <laughs> as artists as well. And I could imagine this was pretty it's pretty extreme for DJs because whether it's like a new genre of music or the latest piece of tech, creatives need a sense of presence where you know exactly what you are, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish. These fundamental things of artistry is really hard for an artist to equate, right? Are you talking about focusing <laughs> yeah, on specific that... things? Yeah, I mean, yeah, even that's... this conversation, I bet a lot of them out there really aren't focusing on what we're saying. You know, oh, There's so many ways this conversation could go there as well. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, yeah, focusing is, is nuts because uh, what do you focus on? Yeah. Like, because music is just, well, everything is so endless anyway. So, um 
you could focus on one specific task, but then the way that task could pan out could just go on forever in different directions. Mm. And so, um, yeah, decision making's hard. <laughs> decision making's hard. But in terms of focus, and I think this certainly applies to yourself, because for you to have the, well, for starters, for, to be a world champion DMC, DJ champion, or any other, you, you have to apply a level of discipline. But the focus side of things, more interestingly, I think comes in, perhaps you can indulge on the breakdown of how you focus on each incremental stage that leads to being a world champion. Yeah, uh, wow, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, mostly it was ego-driven, completely. I had this massive, I still got a massive ego. Um, <laughs> Big I, no, I'm not come scared on, to admit it. I've yeah, got come a huge on, give me a ego. pound on I that think, one. Um, no, it's just, um, you know, I want to be good at shit and I want to show off. Like, yeah. I love it. It looks good when you do it, brother. You keep that, that honestly. <laughs> well, it's just so much fun. We and like JFB, you know, know what I mean? I like making people happy, but, you know, um, I like, you know, I want to be, I want to be special. Fuck but yeah, come on, man. I mean, everyone's special, but like it's that it's that con- continuous like um, need not need but like thrive for acknowledgement. Yeah, you know, like I from want, peers, no anyone like yeah, yeah. From even the, haters, yeah. hater comments and stuff like that. I just I just thrive for acknowledgement Love of it. my existence, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I, I like music and I like scratching and turntables. Yeah, and it's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. DMCs, um, yeah, that was. Uh, that was nuts. So um, I suppose, th- well, going back to this guy who came around my house, it's a mm. year, um, I'm 17, I've been, I suppose I've had these decks for like um, a year in my room. He comes around, he shows me some scratching. He then pulls out these VHSs and uh, the first one was uh, DMC um, 1995 where Ooh. Rock Raider won. Of course. And so Rock that Raider's the first one, one I Noise saw. Noise was on there as well, wasn't it? And there was a Cuba... Um, Am I right in saying that? There was Cubert and Mixmaster Mike also doing a showcase or something. Yeah. Probably. I, he only showed me... On that video was uh, Rock Raider, was which we watched, set. and I was like, wow, I didn't realise this was possible, I guess. And I was like, this is amazing. Mm. And then um, the next video was A-Track winning it when he was 17. Oh, it was brilliant. Yeah, they, these are two pil- pillars in the scene <laughs> for the for the, for the the time, for those of you yeah. just getting into the DJ thing. These so Noise won it in um, 96, right? And, yeah. And A-Track won it 97? Yeah, that's right. And then Crazy, right. Yeah, so it went Rock Raider, Noise, mm-hmm. A-Track, that's it, yeah. Just go and get it right, because I keep forgetting. Did you, used to, did you used to look at them, as mentioned, you know, the idea of incremental stages? Because you've seen them at the final hurdle of their 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 journey of being champions, where they, they're now in front of their peers and in front of an audience yeah. globally um, for its time. That What they were doing was so far ahead. In making them champions, did you ever see the, the? Did you could looking back now? Actually, could you see the the incremental stages that probably went into creating a a winning set like that? No, no, actually not. I just was just amazed and really happy to watch it. Yeah. If that makes sense, yeah. and excited because I didn't know that things like that were possible on turntables, mm. and it it kind of made me excited of what could I could have fun with, you mm. know, just in my bedroom mm. alone or whatever. Um, it was later on, um, 1998, I got a job in a nightclub called The Beach Club, which is where I saw you for the first time as oh, well. Ah, big dad. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, I was watching more DMC videos and I saw um, the 1998 uh, Prime Cuts win the UK final. Oh. And so, like, I, I watched Prime Cuts and then I watched Craze. Big up, my boy. And then I watched... Um, so I watched Crazy's U- US winning routine and then um, after Prime Cuts and then I watched uh, Crazy's winning world routine. Uh, but I was just so blown away by the um, by um, Joel Prime Cuts' um, energy on his set that that just made... I became a massive fan of Scratch Perverts and Prime Cuts. And, and then I was working in this nightclub. I was a glass collector. And I used to take... So good. So I used to... I was a little shit in this club. Uh, Basically, I used to annoy everyone. I used to take my record... I used to loiter around the DJ booth continuously um, when I wasn't working or when I was working as well. And I used to take a a stack of records every single night. And I had... There was this... um, The manager of the club, I had a little... He... I don't know if I hassled him enough for this or what happened, but we had this deal where if I came to the nightclub early, an hour before it opened, cleaned the entire bar for everyone, I could DJ for 15 minutes before the club opened. So Who like, has the real deal here? I mean, <laughs> you, know? I mean, you got the real good end uh, of the deal. But I, I was like, yeah, wow, amazing. So I'd get to the club, 
I'd clean the bar and then all the staff would uh, turn up, the bar staff, and they'd be like, oh, Jean-Marc is working. Brilliant, the bar's clean. We don't have to do anything. So they would just, you know, drink whilst watching me DJ, you know, and pretend to like it. And um, I loved it. But because of this, occasionally uh, DJs would be late. And I knew this would happen. And um, You were just jumping on in. Yeah, well, this nightclub, every Thursdays we had the hip-hop R&B nights. Fridays we had a drum and bass meltdown. We had Big Beach... Boutique, yeah, big. I remember big, yeah, Beach Boutique. which you performed at yeah, as man, well, I love and it. Um, which we occasionally would book, you know, people like Scratch Perverts, Did, obviously Fat Boy so Slim, well. yeah, yeah. yeah, General, um, DJ General Crush. Midi, Crush. Yeah. Uh, the the amount of names that pass through there. Also on the Fridays, it would rotate. So like, um, one Friday would be the drum and bass night meltdown. Mm. One Friday would be a random, you know, third party promoter coming in, mostly doing things like Ninja Tunes. Yeah, yeah. That's I, all right. my records back then were Ninja Tunes and drum. It, do, I was always. Do you know, Vadim, we did the Swallow Vad- Members show there as well. God, man, wow. I remember that. So but I just remember well. um, Perverts playing, yeah. like the full crew, yeah. and um, them getting you on stage. Mm. And I think this was one of the Big Beach boutique ones. Yeah. There was a promoter called Gareth. Do you remember this guy? Yeah, yeah. There's a guy called I'm Gareth. Sure do, yeah, I'm sure do. Anyway, this guy used to run this event. I just I just remember um, my friend grabbing me from the bar, going, they just got a beatboxer on as well. I was like, oh, wicked. So I just like dropped all the glasses. I was like collecting. <laughs> I ran up and, and this guy here was doing something nuts. And um, I hadn't really seen beatboxing uh, properly at this stage. I love and, it. And like, I was just blown away. I was like, oh my God, incredible. <laughs> Absolutely you. amazing. What great and it was just scratch memories. purpose as well. Like it was, it was amazing. Yeah. I think so with, when, with with Scratch Perverts, they really did allow f- a more commercial entry hole for yes. people that were into... Totally, because yeah. they were like... Because um, um, I used to watch their club sets, and yeah, they would do scratching, but they would mix as well, mm. and they would drop drum and bass and mix it with breaks. Back then, Big Beat was huge, yeah. which allowed for loads of uh, breaks-related dance music to become... Mm. You know, I mean, Fatboy Slim was taken off massively worldwide. Mm. Asia, kind of, you know, like, I think back then, breaks and, you know, house, techno, underground music, drum and bass, everything was just, like, almost weirdly really underground, but also commercially accepted at the Mm. time. And it was massive. You know, we had Left Field, we have, you know, Kuvo Mada. Yeah. You know, every... It's nuts. It's true. Derek Delage, Stanton Warriors, you know, Decline. Yeah. All these... All these dons. And then oh Fat Boy Slim was really at the... They're him and Chemical Brothers and Prodigy. Yeah, exactly. They were like the big guns. It's nuts. Weren't they? And, they're, and they're, most of them were playing at this club where I was working behind the bar. And this um, this led to a lot, actually, because the promoter of the Meltdown night, Dave, I didn't realise, had... Um, I used to loiter in a record shop in the lanes in Brian called HVR. Of course. Which is owned by Crafty. That's right, Big Up Crafty. Big Up Crafty Cuts. And... Um, I remember being in there, like, you know, trying to buy records and Dave came down and went, oh, hi, how's it going? I was like, oh, hi, how's it going? Like that, we shook hands and I went off. And then uh, later on, a couple of weeks later in the club, he's like, why don't you hang around in the record shop? I had some um, promos for you. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, we've got the office upstairs. Next time you're in, ask for Dave, you know. So I went in, like, a couple of days later, saw Craft. I was like, oh, hi, is Dave there? And then um, he's like, he called Dave. Dave came down and said, yeah, come up. I oh, went man. up. And then, uh, what was it, um, MC Depp was with Dave in the office. As one does. Big As up, one Depp. Dove. Yeah, and then, um, and then Dave was like, oh, how's it going? Here you go, here's some promos. Give me all these, like, white-labeled D&B tracks. I was like, wow, thanks. Introduced me to Depp. And then took me one floor up into the studio where um, I met Ed Solo for the first time. Ed, um, man. Big up, Ed Solo. And then... Yeah, it was, um, that was kind of, um, this this promoter, Dave, saw that I was um, an annoying, enthusiastic kid, you know, trying to get on the decks nonstop. So um, <laughs> we became, you know, more acquainted and stuff like that. And then one day he called me into the office. And so this drum and bass night was one of the only D&B nights in Brighton and it was called Meltdown. And we walked in the office and it was like, oh, you're here. And he just hands me a stack of flyers like this. And I look at the flyers and it says Mini Melt with Resident JFB on the flyer. Yeah. And I was like, what is this? And he's like, right, so you don't have to do this, but I assume you want to. I've got like a um, um, a regular pub gig at this pub called the Prince Albert, which is by Brighton Station. And it's every other Wednesday and you get paid like £30 for it. And I was like, £30, that's amazing. Yeah, get and paid like, on any sense of exactly. the Exactly. Yeah. And um, he gave me this stack of flyers and he's like, oh, also I'm going to make you resident at Meltdown online. I was like, 
Really? He's like, yeah. And also I run a night in London called Movement with Brian G. And we have an event with Groove Rider coming up. And this other, this new DJ called DJ Markey from Brazil, would you like to play? And I was like, fuck yeah. Like this was, it was nuts. It's like absolute, like if you could, I was literally being offered on a plate, like just what? Everything. Everything could dre dreamt of. It was insane. So I had these flyers and I, these little flyers, I put them everywhere in Brighton and all these like weird spots, like in the toilet, there'd be like a little corner somewhere so just so that people would like go oh what's this and just to catch people's eyes and yeah. people start talking about oh there's this kid going around fly it being really annoying with his flyers and stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah. so um later on i was um playing in this um this pub sorry i'm rambling now but uh I'll no keep going. all right this is like so, awesome <laughs> keep going oh thanks so i'm djing in this, this pub called the prince albert and it's like um i'm playing loads of like moving shadow records loads of like uh early T-Power kind of, you know, psychedelic drum and bass, yeah, but also yeah. newer stuff and merging it with Ninja Tunes music and some hip-hop instrumentals and, you know, trying to scratch. And I was in a jazz band at the time with uh, jazz musicians who were all, like, mid-30s, way older, but in insanely skilled. Like, we're talking, like, they've all oh. got proper jazz skills, yeah. but a lot of them are orchestra, orchestra, orchestrally trained, so I can't talk probably, and also, like, proper funk, you know, they've been in millions of funk sessions, so they all understand how to improvise and I used to I got invited in because one of the guitarists was scoring weed off my mate and saw me scratching and said do you want to come and jam with this I was like yeah sure so I had this like we'd um I'd go in there and set my technic one technics up on um this chair with my little mixer and I'd have a stack of records mostly car boot cell records and I would um listening in the headphones whilst needle dropping looking for little things that were in key or little percussive things that I could scratch into this yeah, 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 this yeah, crazy yeah. thing anyway because so, less is more definitely with the DJing thing is like yeah well that's band, that's right? another story that's taken me a while to learn mm -hmm. um, but anyway so I'm DJing in this bar and I start inviting say the trumpet player from my band or the guitarist or mm -hmm. the keyboard player or the saxophonist and um, so I'm playing uh, in this bar with these musicians and uh, the owner was I didn't know the owner, but he was always listening in the corner somewhere, and he apparently loved it. And he called me up and he said, he just "Gave me a beer," and he's like, "Look, I love what you're doing so much. This is this is really people love it as well. Like, and it's different because back then people weren't really doing stuff with musicians. They weren't cut, and, crossing over and yeah, that age range of genre. It was just so much fun. Yeah, and he was like, "Look, I own the Concord too. How would you like to uh, put on?" Your own night, you can have the club for free on a Tuesday. We'll we'll seal off half the clubs. So you have the bar area, but it's still really big, and I'll give you forty pounds to promote it. And I was like, yeah, thank you, like that. So um, what I did is I then went round and phoned up every single up and coming drum and bass DJ who was like the name in Brighton and said, look, here's the deal. I've got forty pounds. I want to book three of you. I know this is a piss take, you can say no, but I'll give you each £10 and then I'll spend the other £10 on the posters and flyers. And like, I'm so sorry for, you know, offering you only £10. And they're like, no, no, we understand what you're doing. You know, you want to build the cult to the scene. It sounds like fun, we'll do it. So the next thing, so this promoter, Dave, who's doing the only other drum and bass night in town. God, this is good. Go on. He just starts seeing all these posters around town. Yeah. He didn't know anything about this yeah. night. And it's like, and, and I call it Mini Melt as well. Mini Melt, like the Concord 2 with... Blah, 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 like the cream of yeah. the local residents yeah. and JFB. And he's like, he, he found it hilarious and he, he, he saw it and he's like, right, he's like, this is amazing. I'm going to make you more of a resident and make, you know, and he started pushing me more and more, which is great. And I stopped doing this night because I then realised it was conflicting a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, we did, I think, like two of them or something. It was great fun. Whoa. Next thing I know, this, uh, this got promoted Dave is to become, he makes me a resident in movement at Bar Rumba, I get involved in other movement nights. Um, and then he oh. takes over a club in Brighton as promotions manager at the Ocean Rooms and he looks after all the bookings all the nights. And he gave us Tuesdays to run Mini Melt as the the local DB night. We had some other friends of mine who were running that for me. So I was literally the annoying little DJ who got to play all the best spots, but then they would book everyone in drum and bass. And then Fridays was the the cool night. And Dave would book everyone in the sun, including people like DJ Craze. I'm pretty sure you must have been there um, yeah, but, on a Friday yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Um, yeah, I do remember that. It was nuts. I didn't realise how lucky I was for an upcoming, you know, I mean, still up and coming, but as a, a local, you know, well, you became, bedroom you, DJ. Yeah, but you were then pole vaulted into a scene that, for what it is... I'm so you lucky, were, man. It's yeah, great. I was, <laughs> it's yeah, amazing. I'm, and that's kind of what I'm coming to. There isn't always a 
seen because Brighton has always been melty in terms of melting pots of of activities across all cultures cultural spectrums what what's interesting is that you you must have caught the zeitgeist moment of just things needing someone to facilitate and your hunger and desire literally pushed you into that position yeah i had a lot of opportunities that i messed up due to being um uh what's the word very shy okay so like I had, um, so I used to, I was, I managed to get my hands on a computer at some point and started making tunes on it, and I would uh, burn CDs or cassettes and give them out to every DJ possible. Mm. So I had people like um, Dillinger calling me up once saying, "I want to release this track." I was like, "Wow, okay, well it's not finished. I, you know, I only spent a few hours on it." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, send me the parts and I'll finish it." Oh my and, god! And uh, I was like, "Oh my god, amazing!" and um, so I, I remember burning the parts to a data CD and I remember I'd had no idea how to do stems. I, I, like, I was like putting like a kick drum at the beginning to try and make it obvious where that stem started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I burned it and I posted it off and I didn't hear anything back for probably like a year. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, all I had to do was pick up the phone and call him up. But I was too shy to do that. And about a year later, I didn't hear anything. So I got a friend to ask him, you know, and the, 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 the result was, oh, well, you, apparently you sent the stems wrong so he couldn't do anything. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, shit. And it's just because I was shy. I was scared, you know, to call him is up. That, is that a regret? Is, are those... Not anymore because yeah. things turn out how they do. But yeah, yeah. back then, you know, like, wow, could you imagine, like, in I... the early noughties, releasing a track with Dillinger? There's no, um, what, Hospital Records, I give them... Um, this track did come out, but it's a funny story because I was so clueless. So um, I give it. <laughs> so it's Tony Co Coleman, amazing guy, lovely. Yeah. I love Dog. those guys. And um, they played our, our mini melt on the Tuesdays at Ocean Rooms. And I give him a CD. A couple of weeks later, I get a phone call saying, "So you've made this track. It's called The Ritz or whatever. We love it. We want to put it out." And I was like, "Wow!" And I was like, "Yeah, but can you finish it?" I was like, "Yeah, of course." So a couple of months later, um, I had deleted the track. I didn't realise it. It's something I spent a few hours on and completely right. deleted it by accident. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so I recreated this whole other track that was completely different, like absolutely terrible probably, or just overly mm -hmm. musical and lasted like 10 minutes or something like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sent it to them. A couple of weeks later, they, they called back and they're like, um, so yeah, we really like what you did, but it's not really what we listened to before. And like, could you please finish the original track? And I was like... So I had to admit to him, I was like, I'm so sorry, I accidentally deleted the track. And they're like, oh, okay, look, no worries. How about you just get the original track and you edit the original audio file, Master, make it longer yeah. longer enough. I was like, yeah, I can do that, yeah. And of course I did that wrong, right? I was just, I just <laughs> looped it. I did something wrong, I looped it. Anyway, I sent it to them and a couple of weeks later, they, um, they called me back and they were so nice about it. They were like, look, you didn't really do it right, but don't worry, we can do it for you if that's okay with you. And I was like, yeah, please. So they just like, they did a loop and they put like a, I think they put like a, a filter on it where yeah. they're supposed to loop. And it, they did a really good job with it. And it was just like a, a short track called The Ritz. Mm -hmm. And it came out on Weapons of Mass Creation, Volume Ooh. 2. Yeah, on, and mm. it came out on, I think it was on the CD or yeah. um, and the seven inch of it. Um, and, and this was a, co collab a, co a compilation of all different kinds of... Th this was like great. one of their one of my favourite ever albums they ever released. It's mm. Compilations is incredible. And I, was, I couldn't believe I was on it. At the same time, though, I was so, like, shy. Because, like, people... I didn't realise back then that people are busy and hectic and it's so hard to do get shit done. Mm. So, like, when you call people up, you've got to be straight to the point. Yeah. We don't, you know, like... And then, you know, like, I was just really shy talking to people. So I didn't want to piss anyone off i didn't want to bother anyone i didn't want to be that little kid going oh excuse okay. me like, just you know i made another track can i send it to you or did you hear that one or mm. you know that kind of thing just a confidence thing i think yeah. there's a lot of people out there right now that will absolutely relate to what you're talking about it's not an uncommon thing mm. especially of an age when you're still trying to feel the ground as to yeah. whether or not you should shouldn't is it too much to do or say this much to a person yeah well this is before your internet as well yeah, for uh, before sure. youtube so didn't understand you know things you could google you know mm. techno you know tech wise yeah or anything it's taken for granted now isn't it it's just yeah, a given it's nuts google that shit you know what i mean i take it for granted of course I use it every day yeah of course of course it's, it's amazing yeah um, um 
you can learn all sorts of stuff now on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, tutorials on scratching, tutorials on production, tutorials on tech, and and you can even you know there's co there's there's commentary on how people have done stuff as you're watching it. Does that prohibit? Does that cause? Does that dilute the scene in general for tech? And I'm talking in DJ terms now. Does it dilute the competition that everyone has that access to be able to do exactly what anyone else would do because it's you can it's Googleable? Um, I'd say advantage disadvantage. Yeah. So okay. we've got all this new technology. We've got all this new access to information unlimited information it's amazing mm -hmm. like i'd say utilize it in whatever way you can and enjoy um but being limited as well mm -hmm. helps creativity mm -hmm. so much like um so when it comes to a little example making tracks i was talking to beardy man yesterday mm -hmm. and he's like oh do you do this with your tracks do you do that and i was like he's like do you do much automation i'm like not really i just <laughs> copy the track over and put the effect on that bit of track and mm -hmm. then move on and he's like oh why not you can do all this stuff and I was like well kind of like I don't I want to kind of avoid not avoid I just want to keep things limited in a way so mm -hmm. that I can keep my work process going because if I've got too much too many possibilities um, I then have so many more decisions to make mm -hmm. so if I can limit my decision making I will be more creative but advice, uh, what, advice. Did he say, what did he say though to that he was like yeah no that makes sense and he's like but you're going to be missing out on all these things. I'm like, yeah, I know. Advantage, disadvantage. Mm, it's true. But um, I'd rather get things done. Well, it depends, actually. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it does. I'd <laughs> say utilise whatever you can, however you want to, however you can, that's most fun. But um, if you get stuck, try and limit things. Yeah. But, but isn't it... F Big up Beardy, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're... <laughs> Right, going back to uh, your first, um, what you thought was your introduction to uh, DJing and the whole MPC button pushing thing. It's funny how that's, <laughs> that sensibility is actually pro propelling the new tech forward. And now you look at a mixing desk, or a DJ mixing mixer, and you're seeing a, a, just a display that is like, it's Millennium Falcon on ice. Like it's like this does that does that. It's amazing. It's I amazing. It. So it's gone kind of full circle. And I know you say with restriction, but and I know this is where your falls and against are because the the capabilities of this thing compared to what it used to be, it almost mirrors what producers can do. It's it's absolutely insane, and I love it. Yeah, and I I will take advantage of it as much. But there's a cut off point where. I, um, it's kind of like um, I'm using my laziness as an advantage. Yeah. So when I'm like, oh, I can't be asked to go past this point of looking into it, I kind of utilise that in a, in a beneficial way, actually, because it helps me not care too much about going too deep into the technology and I kind of limit myself from that point on. Mm -hmm. Not to say I won't, I will delve into it later on at a different stage, but when I'm working, I tend to use, sorry, I tend to, use equipment and do things specifically for a purpose and a task. Mm -hmm. So if um, if I'm making a track, for example, I won't uh, – I'll just make the track. I won't go on to into my logic, which is what I use, and I won't start fiddling around with logic trying to figure out, experiment on how – things work unless I've got a purpose mm -hmm. to be doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Bill Gates effect, isn't it? He, um, he although I should, I should, because... Um... Oh, yeah, you should. I mean, <laughs> you should, but at the same time, like you say, each part of anything has a delegative aspect to it. And, okay, sure, there's some creative moments where you could join A to C and get B but different, but the, but like you say, that's more of a happy accident. You want to know that the function that it's doing serves you for the right time. Yeah, um, so who I would call my music sensei, which is Ed Solo, like massive respect to this guy. He's helped me so much with multiple aspects of music and turntablism, mm -hmm. even though he's not a turntablist, just understanding the tech and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was around his studio uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago or whatever, 
and we were um, he was helping me mix down one of my tracks, mm-hmm. hopefully for his label. And he was like, John, you need to like you need to make presets in Logic. You need to have it so um, you you can. Um, um, make like a project so it's all ready and set up with all the buses all the mm-hmm. effects everything and I was like yeah you're right he's been telling me this for years I still haven't done it he was like he was like right I'm going to make one for you and he starts making it and then he got distracted because he had to do other stuff and I was like don't worry Ed I'll finish it I promise I'll start doing it from now and I still haven't <laughs> my head just went into you said Ed Zylon then I thought of like all the other dons from Brighton area like Adam Freeland Arrow and first down. The hey go, skills. Hey skills. Crafty. Crafty. The go team. Mex. Did you Mex, meet Mex? Of course, Mex. Mex. Um, Rec. Um, yeah. Rec. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Like wow. so many big. Yeah. Cat skills and. Yeah. Yeah. Johnny Red Reggae. Kind and yeah, you know. Wow. Some legends, man. You were orbiting with some dons. It, it was in, it was insane. Like um, I wish we had half of what it was like. Although. Saying that, I'm kind of I live in Brighton, but I don't really apart from this one nightclub, the Volks. I don't really do gigs because I don't really know anyone else mm. in Brighton now because we've all kind of grown up. Where where's that scene gone? Um, I think there's probably different people and different scenes, factions, yeah. factions that I don't know of that might have that exciting thing that we used to have back then. Mm. Are the clubs doing still the, there though? Is there yeah, a lot of them are different names and things like that. And um, it is, it's crazy because I remember just going out and not knowing where I'm going. And I used to go to like three different clubs. And mm. this might sound a bit arrogant, but I used to be able to turn up and they'd be like, oh, Jean Marc, how you doing? Come in, come and have a drink. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it just, it was amazing. And, of course, because uh, it's a party. It was so, so spoiled. And yeah. um, it was great. And now, like, um, I'm, I, can, I can just walk around and look at, the clubs and I don't recognise the names. It's completely different. Don't recognise anyone. Is that is that, a bit old. is that quite is that is that sad? It's it's it's, it's, it's it was inevitable. Yeah, okay. um, it's kind of maybe a bit sad, but then again, like, I think back to how spoiled I was being able to have that opportunity, those experiences before, mm. and you know nothing lasts forever. Uh, but also, it's quite exciting because there you see new people doing new things. Mm. And like I want, I want them to, you know, do all these new mm. exciting things, and I hope they have an amazing time doing it. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I relate and, uh, mainly because I, I, I'm not originally from London. I'm originally from Sussex way. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Like kind of Gatwick nice. area. So oh, wicked. Brighton was yeah. kind of my yeah, yeah. go to as much as London was, and I, I, I remember like <clears throat> hanging out with a few women in in Brighton for my age, and uh, mm-hmm. they were students. We used to frequent you. Brighton was of its time where you could really have a lifestyle that literally orbited around the club life and the e- extracurricular life. Like, you could... Yeah, yeah. You'd fall into it. It's amazing because Brighton is so small. The, yeah. the city centre, downtown, is tiny. Yeah. And all... So, like, if you went to a club uh, one night and then the next day you went for a breakfast in the lanes, for yes. example... You you were more than likely to see about five six people who were in that club. That's right. Like before, and um, and people were. I don't know if it's the same now, where people were quite friendly or a bit more open to talk to each other, mm. and um, you would most likely see that person. Like, oh, I remember you. Or like, even if you didn't speak to them in the club, you might you know bump into them in the coffee shop. Say, like, oh, you were in that club last night. I saw you. <laughs> so it was great, wasn't it? And then you were making new friends. Mm. And then it might turn out that friend is a musician or a DJ mm. or someone who's working on something that you're working on or you mm. know someone. And then, then you off. know you're working with them or working with their mates or something like that. Rare, rare. Which is what was so special about, about Brighton because of the size. Mm. It would just um, equate to, um, you know, meeting people a lot easier, yeah. interaction. That's stuff right. Like that. Yeah, great. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Still held a real, still does, you know, hold a, you know, real. Uh, it's a magnet for creative people to find a different way of thinking from outside the major yeah. cities. You know what I mean? It's good shit. And the graf- graffiti scene back in the day, you know, it's just the whole culture of it all. Um, so you told a beardy. Did a lot of shows with Billy. Yeah. How this, was that? Well, this guy is crazy on multiple levels. He's like he's one of the nicest people I know, as well as the most crazy, one of the most intelligent, childish people I know, which is great. <laughs> so it's it's so much fun hanging around with him. Mm. He's kind of, um, 
his humour, his childish humour is kind of infectious in a good way. Yeah. And um, he's just he's just nuts. He's like, so I was speaking to him and um, he's he's had this like looping, technological looping setup going for the last maybe 10 years yeah, or something yeah, it's now. it's incredible. And um, every time I see him, he's made improvements. He's always making it better. And I spoke to him yesterday. I was like, what have you been up to? He's like, oh, just for the last few months, I've been completely de-rigging and rigging up my new setup. I was like, of course you have. And I was like, is it going to be more insane? He's like, oh, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. And wow. <laughs> it just doesn't stop. No, it doesn't. He's nuts. And he was like talking about doing some, um, building some new geeky thing for software development as well. Really? It's pretty cool. Yeah, and, I mean, he's... Uh, he's always doing something. And uh, yeah. But the last gig I did with him, this was nuts actually, um, was with Harry Mack. Do you know Harry Mack? Mm. The freestyler from. Um, uh, from LA. Yes, I do, of course, yeah. He's incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, sick. So a few few of my friends have been sending me videos of this guy for years saying, check him out, he's an amazing freestyler. And I, being like um, arrogant as usual or just, you know, I've been like, oh, yeah, I'll check it out later, whatever. And then um, I started watching him. I was like, wow, this guy's really good. Like just um, yeah. like his, his flows, his, his switching of flows and um, he's so quick on words and, um, mm-hmm. and it's very positive what he's freestyling about. He switches everything positively and it's great. Um, anyway, Beardy was like, do you want to do a show with Harry Mack? I was like, yeah. And he's like, right. So um, Harry Mack's doing his debut in England, in London, his debut gig. And we have the, um, I'm going to put forward for you and me to do a thing <coughs> on his encore at the show. So wow. So what happened was we did sound check. I met everyone. Great. They got great team. Super With friendly. the whole gear, you had the whole set up. Uh, Beardy had his whole gear. I had my, you know, set up. And uh, the plan was um, Harry Mack finishes his performance, goes off stage, comes back on for the encore and then starts freestyling about how it's not the end and how something else is happening. Meanwhile, the backing track is Beardy off stage with a long mic cable, just laying down a backing beat, coming on stage, slowly appears and then does a kind of a beatbox backing track whilst Harry Mack freestyles about it. I snuck on stage behind the decks and got ready to record Harry Mack. So Harry Mack had a separate mic, which he picked up and said uh, something, he freestyled something about, and now uh, my voice is going to get sampled and then scratched up by this world champion or something like that. And I pop up and then everything stops and I scratch it in, drop it in. And then Beardy comes in with the beat and I do it like that. And then we're going back and forth and then it stopped. And then, um, then I sampled what we call a sample palette from Beardy Man where Beardy Man gives me a load of samples to scratch. And I was hoping for him to go, ah, fresh, word, bass line, things like that. But no, he goes, <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> like the most typical thing. And then after that, it was like um, Harry Mack got the, the suggestions of things to freestyle about mm-hmm. from the crowd. And um, I was sampling what they said and had it ready you know, with cue points or whatever, looking at the waveforms, and I had to just drop or try and scratch the samples in when he's saying, you know, if he's freestyling about a carrot, and then I'll eat it like a it, carrot. No. Dude, dude, this does not sound like a walk in the park. This no, sounds but it's like what... a complete and utter... I, my nerves would be burnt, man. I'm used to it with Beardy because we've done some really fucking weird shit, really, like... In terms of performance, is there a beady head that you go into when you're a mindset when when you know you're working with them that you're just like right I've, I've got to be re- expect the unexpected be ready and just n- have your chops cut. Um, I just have to swallow my own ego a lot of the time because I I specific all I want to do with beardy all the time is I want him to do solo beatbox. I just want him to have a microphone and, and have it plugged into my unit and then um, everything he does, well, then I can scratch. So if he gives me a beat, I can beat juggle it whilst he does the stuff on top. I can sample a bass line. He does switches to the beats. That's kind of what I want to do with him all the time. But he, which is great though, but he just wants everything to be another level. He was mm. like talking about looping. He wanted me to be looping or try to, or he, he's got his rig so he can send me just, just his mic or just... Um, if he's playing guitar or just his keys. And so he can be looping and I can be scratching on top. He could sample me. I could sample him. We could do, it's nuts, like the possibilities. And um, um, we used to try and do shows, trying to do all this stuff for like, you know, hours or whatever. And it was just chaos. And, but still incredible fun. But now what we do 
if we do gigs, I will probably be supporting him on, say, his tour. Mm -hmm. I will do, like, my thing for half an hour or 45 minutes before he comes on, get the crowd warm up. I come off, he comes on, does his amazing thing, and then on his encore... He comes on stage, and if the people are still cheering for him, he's like, he comes back on stage, he's like, right, who wants JFB back? And then most of the time, crowd like, yeah. And then we come on, and then we do, we have a bit of fun mm-hmm. where, like, you know, he might, I'll ask him to do a fart noise, do an animal noise, <laughs> something, because it's funny. I like, yeah. I know it's childish, but I like scratching like the animal noises or the fart noises because whilst he does the beat, beats and but, you're just, just stupid shit. Are we looking at my face thinking, it, you know, because I. <laughs> I'm taken back by the the fact that you guys are forever pushing the envelope on what it is you can achieve. And by the sounds of it, it sounds like everything that you guys do on entry to seeing each other is freestyled. And I'm thinking, well, if you're doing that live, and if that's the formation of a standard gig, you've got to be on your feet all the time. So how much of that is practice... And if it is practice, how much of that is, ideas-wise, is left on the cutting floor? Because it sounds to me like every single thing is like completely improv. Yeah, we have ideas. I'm like, right, Dan, so what we do, if you're up for it, let's try and do this. He's like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Or he's like, oh, why don't we try... <laughs> Most of the ideas are like really silly and just us being stupid because it's it kind of relates to his uh, personality on stage. Mm-hmm. Like, um, whether he wants to be serious in his show or not, he's always silly at some point. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. great fun. So it allows it. me to to be silly as well. Mm-hmm. And um, But it, it normally goes tits up anything we plan. Yeah, it definitely always goes tits up. <laughs> um, but, like, at the end of the day, he, unless I'm screaming at him, going, come on, let's do this, please, do the animal noises, do the animal noises, or... Like, let's do call and response um, um, baseline scratches or something like that... Um, I normally he normally takes the lead because mm. he is like, in my view, like, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. it's nuts. Yeah, yeah, he's um, like he, to me. He reminds me of the genie in the lamp that got let let free. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And he's just there to he's there completely there to cause chaos. It's, it's, would would it's, I be right in? Would that be an analogy? Yeah, it's, it's great thing? analogy. It's great. It is, it's, it's, oh, <laughs> bless him! Like, got, I just can't wait. Me. I'm just thinking. I can't wait to do more gigs. Yeah, with him. come like, on, um, man. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, but one thing I'll say <laughs> about your technical style, um, DJ-wise, is actually, and I, it goes back to the um, restriction aspect, but also I think you say it's you say it's like laziness. It's not. Um, I was going to say it earlier, Bill Gates is a good saying. It's like, give a lazy person a hard job and he'll find the easiest way to get it done quickly. <laughs> and I think that's the, the attitude that I think in every great respect that you apply in your in your club sets because i've seen you do club sets and first and foremost you're very much about the people you don't want to interrupt their flow of their soundtrack then you'll do something and i i swear to god i've said it numerous times i said it on a bunch of podcasts about you oh wow Yeah, yeah 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 we've talked about this um and it's how you are able to trigger it's almost like the perfect time for juggling without interrupting the track at all. It's like, I've, I've seen you do it recently with the Nirvana. Um, if you go onto his Instagram, you'll see that. Thanks. But it's just, um, it's just so natural. It's almost like it feels like it should be part of the song anyway. And I don't know how you do that. I oh, right. Do so, it. right. So, uh, you what do it in ha- club sets, though. You do it in club uh, sets, which is bonkers. Yeah, yeah. So, this is, right. My plan is, well, has been since maybe. 2008 and I'm still trying to get better at, at this um, this is all work in progress is to um, fulfill my desire for turntablism but still do club party sets and keep people dancing right um, so probably back in 2006 to 2008 I got into juggling a lot more and it just sounded like a mess because all I was interested in was DMC technical abilities but I was still playing all these club gigs and Ed Solo and Beardy Man both said to me, why don't you just get the biggest tune that you like and then make the simplest scratch routine with it? And I was like, um, okay, so I got Killing in the Name of mm-hmm. Raising Against the Machine and I made the routine. And what I do is I edit using, because of Serato, I edit the left and the right audio files. And um, so there is a um, basically one revolution of a record at 33 RPM 
um, on zero pitch is one um, is one point eight seconds. Is it? And that correlates to a bar as one three three point three 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 infinity BPM. And uh, so Scratch DJ's turntable is well myself. We use a sticker on the record, and that is what we use instead of headphones to cue up what we're doing. Right. So what I I was doing. Because I was, um, I learned this from watching Craze. I learned this from watching DJ Rafik, DJ Fly, Netik. Uh, most DMC people would uh, were editing their audio files, uh, um, and um, they were doing it in a way where they could uh, manipulate the arrangement in correlation with the sticker. So I tried to simplify it as much as possible um, with my tracks. So how can I explain this? Um, so I want to I want to scratch everything really, but I want to do a party set as well. So I make scratch routines that I've edited the left and right to correlate and land. So bits of the arrangement will the start point of things that I'm going to scratch in will land on where the sticker position is in my comfort zone. So if that's twelve o'clock on the sticker, mm-hmm. I will make say the start of what I'm beat juggling or scratching starts there. And it's playing, so imagine it's going round. So, so twelve, it's going round. To three, four, yeah, five and if, o'clock. And if right before, say for example, if before one revolution, okay. the the bit that I wanna, I, I the bit that I wanna finish playing before I scratch the next bit finishes before that revolution. Say it finished there. At what, right? like around seven o'clock. I would o'clock. cut the audio, and I would have the next bit that I wanna scratch come back in at twelve o'clock. At twelve o'clock. <gasps> right. So this allows me to create. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the arrange to manipulate the arrangement exactly how I want for a sc- what I call a scratch routine or something. Now, a lot of people who don't really understand what's going on will say, "Oh, it's cheating." He's you know he's edited, he's queued everything up. I'd like to see you do it because it's it's way more risky and way harder. Well, first of all, it's hard to remember what's going on. Yeah. Secondly, um, I'm doing it mostly to make things more difficult, not that I want it to be difficult to show off, but I want to be able to do my turn. I want to scratch things, yeah. but I want to keep things flowing on the dance floor so that I keep getting bookings. And also I don't want people to stop dancing, but I want to scratch. And I want to, I want to, I want to do good, things with turntablism and stuff like that. And I always wondered how you just, sorry, to cut you. Yeah. I always wondered because what you, um, what you've explained there is exactly how I hear it. You're cutting, cutting, cutting. And sometimes if a DJ rewinds back the record to to suit the sound they want to play again, that inevitably interferes with the notation of a song. What's coming the t- next? The timing of the song, yeah. yeah. What's coming ne- next in a bar or four bars. Yeah. It fucks with it because you're actually adding more, but you aren't going back to the original place. Yeah, I, I do admit it takes away the art of working out a way to do it without editing it. That, that's a whole other art where you put stickers on the record, you 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 play something, you keep it going, and you pick the other record off whilst you're scratching and put the other record on, blah, blah, blah. Crazy. Well, it's, which is incredible. And I said it before the uh, beginning of this podcast, I still think there's an endless amount of things to be discovered and done on just two turntables with a mixer and normal records. Mm. But um, being able to manipulate the arrangement of something, like, so... We with Serato or a DVS system or digital, you can you can do anything. It's, yeah, it's right. like you can do it now anyway, right? Yeah, but to a point. Um, so my way of doing scratch routines live at gigs is really risky, and I still have not seen anyone else do it. Fucking because they no, haven't, baby. Well, That's what I'm saying. I mean, like, not not that that is good. I think uh, or nec- I just like doing it, and it's what I, the way I've got used to DJing. But like. Um, it's, it's just, allowed you're me just to bang, 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 bang. Well, off well, it made me realise. Well, well, then I can do all these mashups. Yeah. Like I could make like um like you know like uh, Annie Max mini mixes. Uh-huh. I could do that shit live now. Yeah. And there's no end to how I can do it. So I started doing that, especially with drum and bass. Drum and bass, on jungle is my favourite, mm. one of my favourite genres. And now I can do. I've just done a routine. There's over, I think 160 tracks in eight minutes. But I did it in a way. Hope it work. I think it works because I've done it a few times at gigs and festivals, where people don't really. No one will stop dancing because it's all flows. Um, there's loads of current new tracks in there for the kids, and there's all the jungle classics for the heads. And like, so I was doing this tour in Australia the other week, and every gig I did it in, there were I could see like you know there's quite a few people at the front watching or 
just watching it and really enjoying it, but everyone else was still dancing and it didn't break the flow mm. unless I fuck up really badly. But I make but it so you, I don't. But they're watching you because they know that you're you're artisan in it. You're crafting it as you're going. I, I, what? That's a spectacle yeah. in itself. I mean, it's, it? it's a really selfish thing. I just want to do it because I love turntablism and scratching. Um, I love mixing. I love letting tunes play. I love playing with effects and mixing in interesting ways and scratching, maybe just scratching over mm. something or letting things play, leaving space. I love that as well. But I love doing scratch routines because it if people see notice what you're doing you do get a crazy um hype mm. in the room and if you can do that in a way where it keeps people dancing but yet they want to see what the yeah it's on. been it's been a work in progress for a long time because um uh i know there's a lot of promoters out there who only see my scratch videos and they think oh yeah i'm not going to put this dj because it's, it's turn a too much. It's yeah. too much. People look, and I've had other DJs, you know, like bigger ones that I respect, say, "Man, if you just did ten percent of what you do, it'd be amazing." And um, they say that with beatboxing too, bro. Like, but uh, the, but I think common. fuck it, I don't care. I'm I'm just gonna keep doing it because I'm I'm getting the bookings. Yeah. it's working and it's fun. And um, maybe what I have to do is like maybe do some more like audio mixes and more get more videos of myself playing out live so people can really okay it's okay it's not going to ruin the party yes i'm going to fuck this shit up <laughs> promoters trust trust in the jfb uh i can't see it ending and then then you've got this collaboration well i let's call it sparring partners you know with mr switch and oh, wicked. Seeing you guys kind of get involved and how does that work actually because you guys are different quite different styles um well unfortunately we've both been really busy like um, him especially, and like to find time to do stuff is nearly impossible. That's happened, man. Um, he he I hooked us up because he, he's working with Pioneer. He hooked me and Angelo up to do a thing with him for Mix Mag. Yeah, yeah, big up Angelo. Angelo. Um, and that was amazing fun. But mm. um, like, I'm actually I really want to schedule something in with Switch big time because yeah, every time we've had the chance to do something, it's been great fun. The last video we did was probably 2017. Yeah. And we we made that routine in a day. It's fucking great. Right. <laughs> it's a bit where <laughs> bless him. <laughs> I made it. I made him pick up the record, and I stick my foot on it, and I start scratching it. But I, just, I, I keep forgetting that he had to have this stinky foot like near his head. <laughs> 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 well, just almost just it's missing his nose by inches or some yeah, shit. Yeah. His hands fucking. Bless him. These hands are insured, man. They got to be. I mean, have you got anything insured? Your hands insured? <laughs> it's a gamble. Is it? I was thinking about DJs. I mean, I guess they're the same with beatboxing, but yeah, it's a gamble, isn't it? Yeah, I should really insure my hands, but um, if I didn't have any hands, how would I fill out the insurance form? <laughs> yeah, it's too late. Too, too late. Yeah. <laughs> After you want to do it before then, but yeah, I get where you're coming from. What's the future, my brother? Um, hopefully a lot of fun, mm. a lot of collaborations, a lot of... Um, oh, I'm making a lot of drum bass at the moment, like a lot. Yo, um, Dillinger, yo, you know what time it is, baby. Come on, uh, man. No, no, I need to make something really good if I'm going to approach him. Um, well, actually, some stuff's getting better. Yeah, I've don't, got, don't um, doubt that for a the, second. The but... sensei, Ed Solo, has uh, showed me a lot of new stuff. It was really good. And um, I've been making use of the jet lag. Good man. Which is, um, Fuck yeah. you wake up at like 4.30 in the morning and like it, you can't go to sleep. I don't want to wake up my missus. Um, so I just get up quietly make myself a coffee go in the studio and just end up making drum bass it's brilliant isn't it the best to wake up early i rate that so much man yeah i miss staying up late though and making tunes because it, it's those times of day like sometimes mm. in the morning or twilight yeah you get more creative mm. i love all mm. that shit um if there was to be one place where you could record and collab and a person who you could collaborate with where, who and where would it be Everyone, anywhere. Really, <laughs> you just rate you. You just rate collaboration. I, I rate everyone. Like whether it's um, someone who's, oh god, that for anything. But like, say it's turntablism and someone's come to learn some scratching and they've never touched the deck before. Mm. They're always going to do something you don't expect, and you're always going to learn something from that. God, I love that. So like, yeah. um, I've learned, you know, and then obviously there's the idols who you look up to or have looked up to all these years. Um, no, prime cuts, you jam with prime cuts. Yeah, actually, I, I was trying to hassle him years ago, and he very politely was 
getting back to me saying, yeah, when we get time, blah, blah, blah. It probably won't happen, but it would be good. Joel, let's do it. And then um, <laughs> uh, it would be amazing because yeah. uh, it'd be really fun to do something with mm-hmm. everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might be some, oh, I can't say it because it, I don't know if it's going to happen. There might be some big things happening. Really? Big things with big people or big a big thing that's going to develop into a big thing but I don't know it might not happen and I can't talk about it just in case we're very close to exclusive there <laughs> ladies and gentlemen it's really fucking close I could see I could see him just <laughs> pittering away with the lips telling us about what it was going to be oh, well that's all to be revealed in the future then ain't it yeah if it happens it'd be great yeah and how we find out on the Instagrams and all that all that business um, yeah of course yeah just the normal thing I just yeah um I can't say anything, I suppose, because I don't... I've just been giving some people some ideas on something who have what seems to be the opportunity to do amazing things with their platform. How exciting. And, uh, Curiosity's killing. All yeah. right. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. We'll have to see, won't we? <laughs> JFB, my brother, thank you so much for joining oh, thanks us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much. <laughs> <It's been quickest. laughs> Insightful. I, I got lost a lot thinking mm. myself, fuck. Oh, that's so true. So good. I love this. We love this in this podcast. So what we're doing here on the streets, out here, really fucking out here doing it. Big up my Brighton crew. Uh, sharing is caring. You know what it is? Tell a friend to tell a friend. Keeping it nice and movie. That's what we're here. We're out here doing it. Um, crime don't pay. Neither do they. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. Stay lucky people. Jeff B tells you so. Peace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>